So uh, let me tell you a little bit about dentistry. My father was a dentist and uh, I so enjoyed um, the very privileged life I had because he was a doctor and a dentist but I only remember his dental career and uh, I used to go and around six years old I used to go in an office get around his feet until he threw me out he would just say get out of here the patients would think I was cute and I would just watch him work and I was just taking it all in and, and there's so much to take in and I learned so much by watching him. I never thought of my father like I was the artist, I was the skilled guy, but I never thought my father was skilled until one day I was, I think I told this story before, I was walking in my town, I had come back from Bangkok during the summer and I was downtown and of course the whole downtown disappeared, all the quality stores disappeared and you're probably old enough if you're watching this to know what a 5 and 10 is. There aren't any 5 and 10s that I know of around anymore in America. We're talking 50, 55 years ago. So uh, I used to go in and hang around my father's office and very often he would take impressions of teeth. And that was pretty interesting. He'd take out a rubber bowl and a spatula and uh, a big can of what looked like plaster and he'd put it into the rubber bowl and mix it up with water. And, I, and in those days, I remember my father used to use tap, tap water and just mix it up until that right consistency. And he didn't have a formula. He sort of knew by hand uh, how to mix that plaster and how liquid it had to be. And it would get to a point where it was pretty vis viscous and thick, and then he'd put it into a dental tray, which was uh, an impression tray made out of aluminum or stainless. And they had one for the top of your mouth and one for the bottom of your mouth. So he might be taking an impression of the top of your mouth of your teeth. And you had, he would position this thing. It had suction attached to it because as soon as it, he'd push it into your mouth and push it up, it, it would squeeze out all the air around your teeth. It was a good impression. And he'd wiggle it around and within about, uh, you'd, be, you'd be laying there back with that dental light in your, you can probably remember this, while that thing was setting up, and that, that tray. Now sometimes they took it with uh, um, an impression that was uh, flexible, like, like rubber-like material, but often they took it with this dental stone, which looked like plaster. And then he had a devil of a time breaking the suction and taking that thing out cleanly so it would be a very clear negative impression of your whole bite, of your whole top teeth. And of course he might, uh, well that would be one session and you'd go home and he'd send it to a dental mechanic and the dental mechanic would make a positive of that negative. So don't forget this is negative. So the dental mechanic would spray in a silicon uh, release agent and then pour in uh, uh, another plaster of kind called, uh, it was called dental stone, he pour that right in and uh, would, would come back to my father and a manila envelope was your teeth in 3D. And he would sit down with you and discuss things and say, I'm going to extract these three teeth and I'm going to make a bridge here. And those three teeth are not strong or some reason that he was going to change them. Or it might be just one tooth and he said, I'm going to cap this tooth because the top of this tooth is ruined. And, he, and how many of you today have a gold cap in your mouth? Well, anyhow, um, you might have a gold cap in your mouth. I had several at one time, but now I don't even have teeth. I'll tell you that I was walking along this one summer. I came home from Bangkok, and this old guy comes up to me and he goes, Hockey! And he points right in my face, Hockey! And I said, No, 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 I, that's my father. He says, Oh Christ, you look just like your father. And he says, You know that your father, I was his patient, and he made this. Uh, he made this, these teeth for me. I've had them in my mouth 40 years. And you tell me, a and then he reached into his mouth and grabbed that denture and 
rocked it back and forth and took it out and held it up to me with all the lunch the guy just ate and the spinach attached to it and showed it to me and said, you show me a dentist that can make something that's made properly, properly, that will stay in your mouth for 40 years. So I realized my father was a really good craftsman. He made, he, he made really good stuff. And this guy was a testimony that I never expected. He says, you look just like your father. You, if you're lucky, you don't have your father's damn temper. Oh, my father used to get mad at his patients. And he didn't have any patience, my father, you know. And there is another story that I'm going to tell it another time where he actually punched a patient in the mouth and broke all his teeth. And I was there. I was in that room when my father did that. It was a German guy. I'll tell you that story at another time. So anyhow, that was one of the ways I found out that my father was good dentist. You know, and this guy was... Um, he was letting me know that I was uh, lucky to have such a good father, such a great technician. And uh, so my father, I, I watched this process of sending things to the dental mechanic. So I watched him send waxes to the dental mechanic. He would have a wax tooth that he carved. And he'd have a little alcohol lamp with 75% or 80% isopropyl al alcohol in a little Bunsen burner. And, he, and I see him, you know, in his off hours, sitting in the office under his dental light, and he's carving this tooth. And, or it's a cap, and it's going to go on top of, it, of, a, of a tooth that's broken. And he'd be trimming it and all. And then he very carefully, you know, this was so fascinating to me. If you were me, you'd be fascinated too. And then he would take such good care of that little piece of wax which was a person's top of his tooth, or a person's whole tooth, and he'd wrap it up in cotton and put it in a vial, and he had his own sticker, which said Dr. Hochberg, and uh, his address and telephone number and everything was on that sticker, and put it on a vial, and put it in an envelope, and then the dental lab would send a messenger regularly, I think twice a week, and they'd take that, and, it, and what would come back would be that little wax, cast it in gold. Now, I didn't know it, but my father told me it's a very accurate process. If you even scratch that little wax, when you get back the positive, the casting, it'll have the scratch in it. It was accurate, he told me, to one twenty-five thousandth of an inch. Think of that in your mind. It's incomprehensible, but it's true. So if you push your fingerprint into the wax, you get your fingerprint back. And I started carving little waxes. And my father was so thrilled, thinking that I, I was going to be a dentist. No way was I going to become a dentist. But I used to carve these little uh, uh, characters, little devils and skulls and uh, little men like rock musicians with their guitar and everything. And I would, my father would send it along with his work to the dental mechanic and they'd come back cast it. And often I would put a little loop in them, let's call it like a jump ring, so that when you got it back, you could wear it around your neck, this little guy that you did with extra long arms or big hands. I would work on these things for hours. And we're talking about something that's a half an inch big. And you're saying to me, well, Jerry, now and now you got into teaching jewelry. Yes. Yes, you are quite right. I got into it because this was fantastic. I learned about lost wax casting. Now, this process is 3,000 years old. It's as old as the Egyptians. They cast it in gold. And if you don't believe me, go to the British Museum and go to the Egyptian jewelry and look at the flies and the scarabs that they would carve out of wax and cast into gold. So it's an amazing process. And today I do that with my kids. I, I give them a little piece of wax and it's called negative carving, all right? Because what you don't want, you carve away. You would take your little model and it could be a beetle, it could be anything that was organic, even tree bark. Uh, the plant's too fragile. 
But anything that, like if it was a little piece of wood or a Y-shaped piece of wood that came out of a tree, you could put that on the end of the wax, all right? So you have this cone of wax with a rod coming up and the model sitting on top of it and you blend the wax, there'd be some transition from the wax rod going into the model. Now you put a can around this and you mix up this cristobalite, this heat refractory material that looks like plaster and mixes like plaster and you mix it up and you try not to get a lot of bubbles in it. You paint your little model with soap because it would make the uh, investment stick to the model better. Okay, so you take a brush with some from dish, uh, dish soap for cleaning dishes and you paint your model and then you put a can around it and seal the bottom with modeling clay and pour in this investment. You just pour it right in. You shake it a little bit so all the bubbles come to the top and within 30 minutes it gets hard and when you pull the bottom off the can where that cone is, the cone shape is there and you can see the rod that leads down to your model. Now, here's how this process, which is 400 years old, works. Here's how it works. It's amazing. You take, you take your can, put holes in it. You can drill some holes around the outside. And then you put this in a kiln at 1350. And you leave it in there for like an hour, sometimes two hours. Well, of course, all the wax uh, melts out of the can. It actually vaporizes and the smoke comes out. Now, normally casting waxes are poisonous, so you don't want to breathe in when the kiln is on. You don't want to be in the same room. So you let, you let the wax disintegrate. The wax vaporizes and leaves its little shape, whether it's an insect or it's actually a wax thing you casted or a car or whatever it is, you, it disappears, and it leaves its cavity in the plaster. Now you've got a plaster mold with a hole going to your model. Now you take that, and at the college they had a centrifuge machine with a little furnace in it. And you take your silver or your gold and put it in a little furnace, and the furnace has a hole in the back of it. You wind this machine up, this is like an arm now, with a... a, a furnace on the end and your casting can on the end, it's called the casting ring, and a weight to counterweight it on the other side. You had to weigh it, make sure the arm was balanced and then screw the arm tight and it had a spring and you would turn this thing three or four times and hold it back and melt the silver or the gold with a torch in a little furnace to turn into a liquid and then let go. And as soon as you let go by centrifuge force, the metal goes right through the back of the furnace hole, into your can, into your mold, and makes a perfect replica of whatever you carved in wax. And this could be something organic. It could be a button. You can cast anything that's uh, organic and that will burn away. Uh, so um, then you'd get back your little man that you casted. That's how it's done. And that's how it was done in dental laboratories when they casted a crown for a tooth. So I got back my little castings. Now this guy, Austin Goodwin, this teacher that I had, he loved me. I was the only kid that was obsessed with this process. So I was carving little waxes into the night. And of course I got myself a head magnifier and I worked under a loop and I could put incredible detail. I would do these women with their hair flowing and their beautiful little bodies and a little ring attached to them. I could wear it around my neck. This is how you make jewelry, okay? And, and casting is fantastic. And you can even cast stones in place. If you, if you want to put a stone in, some stones will stand up to the heat. Others will, be, will fracture and fall apart. Okay, so I got into this casting process, and I was in my, in my college, I was Mr. Casting. Everybody thought, oh, this guy's amazingly, an amazing artist, you know. This is how I got into jewelry. I started casting, and it was all through my father. 
when I was eight years old and getting fascinated with what he did uh, to give me a privileged life. You know, and I was the son of a dentist and he was an amazing dentist and he was an amazing man. He knew every fact. And I, I don't know if I ever told you this about my father, but my father, you could, you could say, uh, Dad, there's just some guy called the Elephant Man. He had a disease. And my father would say, oh, yeah, sure. His name is, and he'd tell you the name of the Elephant Man. And he had acromegaly, which is a, a uncontrolled growth of the bones of the head growing. And that's why he looked like he did. My father knew every fact. He, he was a genius. He was so well read and so amazing. And I'll always remember that about him. And that's, that's one of the reasons when I'm walking around the lake, I, I'm sort of holding his hand and talking to him. He, he's, he's alive for me today. But anyway, I don't want to get into all of this. I want to get into how I got into so much trouble. So basically, I love this course in, in uh, Teachers College. And I thought, I'm going to open up my own store and sell my stuff. I had lots of, I had hundreds of things that I made, little trees, little beautiful flowers, all casted out of wax, and all casted into uh, generally cheap metal, silver or uh, dental alloy, but I casted some things into gold. And then I put them in a window. Now I took a storefront in an indigent neighborhood in the worst part of town because it's the only rent that I could pay uh, on a regular basis. So I. I had a store, and I had a big sign over the store, and I painted my own title on it, and it was called My Art in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And it was in the worst part of town where there were mostly indigents, homeless people, and winos everywhere. So uh, during the day, uh, my door chime, my bell on the door would ring, and I'd come to see who's coming to the door. I always kept the door locked. because. I was going to certainly get robbed in this neighborhood. I had a steel thing that closed up my window. And I had sculpture for sale in the worst neighborhood in the world. And no one was ever going to be my customer. You know, I never made a dime there. And, and I'd have winos walk in. And they would go, uh, you, uh, you, first they asked me for money. And then they'd say, what is it? I want, I want to buy one of those things. And they didn't even know what they were looking at. You know, they were driving me crazy. So every day I had to throw people. I didn't throw them. I treated them nice because I didn't want to become, have enemies in the neighborhood. They all liked me. In fact, they'd come in two or three with a bottle of, of gin and, and be talking to me and, and taking half my day. But uh, that was the only storefront. And I remember telling my jewelry teacher about my store and he should come and see it. And he actually brought his beautiful wife in a beautiful car and came into my store and he just thought, well, he doesn't have any other students like me. So he thought, pretty cool, you know, I've, I've got this little store and I'm trying to sell my art in, in a neighborhood where no one's ever going to come to look at my art. And I got, it was actually in the newspapers in my town that I had this store called My Art and, and, and in a neighborhood that didn't support or you didn't even understand what art was. So uh, I cast it in that store. I had a, a whole jewelry shop in that store. And of course, I was still taking the class at uh, Newark State College in those days and making stuff. So here's what happened to me. I had this fantastic lady in my town who was the coordinator of art for 30 schools. We had, you had coordinators for English, for art, for science. Uh, uh, and uh, these were uh, in City Hall. In the City Hall, in the Board of Education, there was, a, there was a person who was the coordinator for all these different departments. Well, my art teacher told this lady about me, and um, she, was, she was like, uh, I don't know, to me she was like my benefactor. She, just, she was trying to make me into a teacher. She said, you should be teaching this. Why don't you teach this? And she is the one that inspired me for 60 years of my life at this point uh, of teaching. She's the one that got me into it. And she's the one that told me, 
look, you, you'll go to school, you'll be bored with uh, art history and a lot of other courses you're going to have to take, but you'll get through them, get a C, she said, but just get your teaching degree. And as soon as I came out of college, she put me in a junior high school, and I'm not going to go into all of that. But anyhow, I was the big jeweler, and uh, uh, she once came to me, and she said to me informally, look, uh, there's a lady who's an art coordinator like myself. She's written three books on plastics as an art form. She's famous, and she lives in a, in a really beautiful part of Westfield, New Jersey. Now, Westfield is a real upper-class area with beautiful, beautiful, expensive homes and some old, beautiful homes there, too. Westfield's a beautiful place. If you were to go there today, you'd say, wow, it just, it just knocks you out. It's, it's just... It's for the rich. And she said, I've shown her some of your work. Do you have some photographs? And I said, sure, Marion. Now, this lady's name is Marion Quinn Dix, and she's long gone. And her husband's name was Lester Dix. And she was an artist, and her husband was an, a, a real amazing artist. They had, I loved their house because it was a library of art books, uh, these coffee table books that were as big I mean, huge, and they were all beautiful, you know, and you couldn't afford these books. They were like $80 for a, a book, and, I, and she collected art books, and she really was into me. She was, she was so inspiring to me. She said, you know, I need people like you in the classroom. You, you'll have a ball being this. This is what you should do with your life, and she convinced me, and I, and I, and I started uh, going through art education then to get my art degree, to get my teaching degree. And actually, I started in a junior high school. So, Marion Quinn Dix, God bless you, we are out there with my mother and my father. And uh, you're the uh, person, the angel in my life that got me into all this. Well, she introduced me to a friend of hers, and I never met her, but I was told about her. Her name is Thelma. I'm not going to tell you her last name. Uh, because it was horrible what happened. So I went to see this lady in this very rich home, and she had fountains out in front of her house, and with, I think, sculptures made out of plastic. She wrote three books on plastics. And I can't tell you the names of those books, but I actually got so angry at one point that I went to the public library, and I'm telling you of a criminal offense. I took her books and I burned them. Can you imagine what she did to me? So anyhow, I met this lady, and she was nice to me, and I had a Volkswagen in her driveway. My crappy Volkswagen didn't belong in her driveway. She had such a ritzy-looking house, a fountain in the front and a fountain behind the house. And when you went in the house, you had a sunken living room. Only rich people had sunken living rooms with uh, beautiful couches all around the inside with a big coffee table and masks from South America that she probably bought off uh, South American Indians, you know. These beautiful masks from all over the world, as a fact. Some were Japanese. They collected masks. And her whole house, her whole living room, this huge living room in this huge house, was all beautiful South American masks. I remember being so overwhelmed when I walked in there. And, and I'm acting like the big artist, the big jeweler. I'm a jeweler. I'm a jeweler. And I was going to get a commission from her. She just came back from South America. And she said, and she's talking to me, and she said, Marion tells me that you're a wonderful craftsman, and I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you, I forget what you call it, but I'm going to give you a, a, a job if you want it. And she said, now you have to take very good care of these, and uh, over the coffee table. And she had two sons sitting there that were in their second and third year at Princeton University. So this gives you an idea of the echelon that this family was at and a wild hawk bird. I, I'm, I'm in this lady's living room. I'm so impressed, you know. I'm going to call my mother and tell her I just got this commission, this job, to make something for this woman. And she's a famous artist. She, she's written three, four art books. So uh, 
she uh, takes out this little box and, uh, and she has a tissue paper inside, you know, the kind of tissue paper that's been touched a lot. I mean, it's all crinkled and beautiful. And she, and, and it's pink, and she opens it up, and there's four beautiful emeralds. Now, I've never even seen an emerald, and I know nothing about gemology, nothing. You know, I see the three emeralds, and then there's two diamonds. And she said, my husband gave these to me for my birthday. We just got them back from South America. And I said, oh, they're very beautiful. And she said, well, I don't know if I should get insurance before I give them to you to start to work on, but I want you to make me a ring with all five or six stones in the ring, the two diamonds and the emeralds. And I said, oh, sure, I can do it. You know, well, I can do that, I, yeah. I like to work organic. Do you like organic? And she said, oh, I love your work. I've seen your work. I've seen Marion has shown me pictures of your work. So, so I love, I'd love you to do it, but I want a, a really beautiful ring, something like nobody's got. So I said, well, I gotta, could I take the stones with me? And she said, you can, but they're not insured. You've got to take very good care of them. So I had no idea how much they were worth. And I asked that question, I said, how much... She said, well, they're worth approximately a little bit more than $12,000. Of course, I didn't. I didn't move one eyelash. I said, oh, 12000 Okay, they're very beautiful, and I'll take care of it, and I'll, I'll do this for you. It's no problem. $12,000, yeah, sure. I'll do it. I never... You're talking to a guy who hadn't had $50 in his pocket, you know. If, that, if I ever had that, I was lucky because I spend money like water. I never had any money. My mother would give me some money or, or I'd talk my father into giving me money and, and, and it, was del it was gone instantly. And today, I'm the same as I was when I was young. No, no one ever actually really changes, you know. So I took the money, I mean I took the gems in this little box and I brought them back to my shop. And I started working day and night on her model. You know, I got her ring size. I, I did that roughly with a piece of paper. You know, today, I still take ring sizes with a piece of paper. It wasn't accurate, but it was rather accurate. And I would take that back to my shop. And on a mandrel, I started creating this wax. I'm working into the night. Okay, and she called me. She called me several times and asked me, how's the work coming? How's the commission coming? And I went, oh, uh, Thelma, it's almost, it's almost ready. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm just looking right now, and I see this little ring that I... I didn't carve this. I made this uh, little unit. I, I don't know why I keep going off in these terrible little tangents, but... Uh, so I was working on this ring, and I was working on it for like a week and a half, and I'm talking about work into 4 o'clock in the morning, because I generally work all night. I just can't stop. My mind doesn't stop. And I was trying to come up with an idea to hold each stone in position, to show them off, you know. And she told me she didn't want it too big, you know, make it look feminine, whatever that means, because for some women, feminine is gigantic. So I worked on the ring, and I put the stones in, you know. I tried them in the ring, and it looked pretty good. And I polished the wax. There are ways of polishing. This is a hard wax, it takes a lot of detail, and I polished the wax with water and cotton. And I got the ring looking pretty good when the stones were just positioned in. So I called her up, I said, Thelma, I, I'm, I think I'm finished. And she said, oh, could you come over? Would you drive over? Well, it was, a, it was more than half an hour to get to her house, and in, in my crappy Volkswagen, I, I had this yellow, falling apart Volkswagen, and drive it up, and she had one of these curved driveways that rich houses have around the fountain, and I came up in her beautiful white house, you know, with a porch, and I ding dong, and, the, and as I remember the doorbell goes ding dong, ding dong, dong ding, ding dong, and uh, she came to the door, and she said, Jerry, I'm so happy to see you, come in, come in. So, let's go to the living room, and, and I, of course I walked through the vestibule into this sunken living room with the masks, you know, and her two sons were sitting there, very handsome guys, you know, and I understand what her husband did. He owned a five and ten named Newman's 
And I think it was in Perth Amboy. Perth Amboy, maybe in Perth Amboy. That's where it was, or Jersey City. I think it was Jersey City. And he had this 5 and 10, and it was named Newman's. So she, her, that was her actual livelihood, besides the fact that she was the art coordinator for uh, maybe Westfield, New Jersey. I don't know where. And the two sons are sitting there. I'm so intimidated. These guys had, their shirts were perfect. They had, they had dress shirts on. They both had ties. And they looked, in those days, they looked like they go to Princeton. They had their hair cut. These guys were not wild-looking guys like college kids are today. These guys were, these guys were ready for the corporate world, and they were getting there. You know, and her husband was sitting there, who was a mild kind of guy. That was Mr. Newman from Newman's Five and Ten. So I, uh, I, uh, I unboxed my wax, and I held it up, and I passed it to her, and she said, "What do you think, boys?" She said to her two young Princeton, uh, nearly graduates, and they both said, "Mom, go ahead. It's beautiful." And I put all the little stones. I said, "Be careful. The stones." kind of stuck to the wax, so it was okay, and I handed it to her, and she looked at it, and she turned it around, and she said, yeah, well, she said, yeah, well, it's truly, well, this is how you know that she, uh, where she got to, and how she got to where she was, you know, sort of an artist, she said, yes, it's truly 3D, it's, it's got wonderful 3D, and it, what it looked like, it looked like Carl under the ocean, with maybe a sea slug in it, you know, or something like that. Everything I ever made looked organic. I loved trees and roots and things like that. Even this ring that I've just been working on, not done with it yet, uh, looks organic, you know. So uh, she said, uh, what do you think, boys? She let the kids make the decision. They said, go ahead, go with it, Mom, go. And, I, and she said, well, you know how much I'm going to give you uh, I'm going to give you the stones. I'm going to trust you with the stones too. You have to sift them. I said, "Oh, I'll take care of everything." Like I'm like such a great artist, you know. I have setting is nothing for me. I never set a stone in my life before. I never set a stone. So anyhow, um, uh, she said, "Can you do it in platinum?" I didn't move one eyelid. I kept. I'm such a good liar, you know. It's a great liar. I said, platinum, sure, I can do it. I thought, Selma, I don't know why you want platinum. Silver is more beautiful than platinum. She said, no, I like platinum. It's a very hard metal. I like platinum. Can you, can you do it in platinum? I said, maybe you want me to make it in silver and plate it in platinum. She said, no, no, I want it in, in, in really good quality platinum. I said, absolutely, I'll do it in platinum if you like. So the, 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 at that point, her husband got up and he went to inspect it. He's holding it up and he's looking at it and he says, ah, I think that's nice, Thelma. Uh, Thelma, Thelma, I think that's nice. I think it's nice. So I got the okay from everybody. I uh, put my ring back in the cotton, back in this little box, and I said, do you, do you have anything to hold the stone? Can you guess how this story is going to end? She said, do you, do you have anything? I said to her, do you have a little bag to put the stones in? And she had a little plush bag, a beautiful uh, purple plush bag. And she put all the stones in there, checked, there were five, five stones. And she cinched the bag up, the little cord that you pull, cinched the bag up. And I had the, the stones, $12,000 12, worth of stones, and my, my great model from the sculptor of the world. I was the artist of the world. And I got in my crappy Volkswagen. And wouldn't you know, the minute I got in my Volkswagen and started it up, it backfired. Two or three times. Boom! It scared the hell out of the whole family. They were standing outside while I drove away. And bang! 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 And, and, and I got in my crappy Volkswagen, uh, which needed a tune-up seriously. And I drove through this town of Westfield, which is all ice cream parlors, and it looks like a storybook town, all these houses that uh, today cost millions of dollars. And I got back to my home, and the very next business day, I, 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 I was trying to find a place that could cast platinum. 
So uh, through the Yellow Pages, I found a place in Newark, New Jersey, and the guy does platinum. So I went there with my ring, my wax ring, and I showed it to him, and I showed him the stones. And I actually put the stones in place, and when he saw the quality of those stones, he said, oh, you have some inclusions. He said, Inc inclusions in the um, emeralds, there's uh, a few inclusions. I didn't know what the hell an inclusion was. And those are a little bit of lines. Emeralds are never pure. They always have some little bits of lines and things inside them. I didn't even know what that meant. He said, yeah, sure. So I'll cast it for you in a week, but you have to give me 1100 US dollars. I said, 1100 dollars? I had no idea how much plastic a platinum cost, so immediately I went to a phone booth and called my mom and I said, Mom, I need $1,100 for platinum. I, I got a commission from this lady to make her ring. And my mom said, how much are you going to make? And I said, well, I think I'm going to make about $4,000, four or $5,000. My mother said, you're going to make four? I've never made, you know, I'm, I'm usually washing some guy's screens from his house were raking leaves, you know, and I said, yeah, I'm going to make about 4000 on this. And she said, I'm so proud of you. Are you really going to do this? And I said, sure, Mom, remember all the waxes? I, I'm pretty good at wax casting. She, did, she said, you have the stones, are you insured? I said, no, I'm not insured, I don't, I don't, I'm just going to put them, hide them in my basement apartment. My mother said, you, you better take very good care of them. No, my mother knows me very well. She said, don't you forget where you put them. I said, no, no, don't worry about it. Could, could, could you forward me this money? Well, my parents had money. And I never asked for money like that, asking for you. I, I asked her for uh, 1,200 US dollars. And I went to her and she gave it to me. And she said, now this is a loan. And I said, mom, I know. And as soon as I make this money, I'm going to pay you back. So I already was now making, like, if I made money, I was going to make about $4,000 on his job. And it was my first commission. I was going to tell everybody. I told my mommy. And her friend came over, and I told her friend that I had this commission for $4,000. And she said, oh, isn't your son wonderful? You know? So I took it home. I, I uh, went to the caster. I brought him everything. I brought him the... The, uh, the wax, I was so careful with it, because it was summertime and all the thing I had to do was melt. I got to him and I gave him the wax and three days later he called me up and said the ring is finished. And I, I had actually put little wax prongs on the ring so the stones fit the, the cavities where they go perfectly. I made sure of that and I left little pieces of metal for prongs. So all I had to do is put the stones in after I finished the ring and polished it and just bend the prongs down and I was done. So I got a, another phone call from Nervous Thelma. She called me up and she said, uh, how you doing? And I said, well, I got the ring back in platinum. It's beautiful and I have to clean it. And I took my father's old uh, handpiece, uh, dental handpiece, and I started to clean it and work on it and polish it and meticulously, and of course that took me maybe 14, 25 hours. I, I, I don't know how many days it took me just to polish the thing. I got it all right, and I put the stones in place, you know, and they all fit really well. And then I was gonna set it, and I didn't have a setter's ball, a special ball that you set diamonds. And I didn't know how to set anything. So I went out to the library, and I got a book about setting diamonds, but it was a classical book, with classical settings, with special settings, and it showed how, you, how the setting had to be shaped for the table of the stone, and how the prongs had to be finished and bent down over the stone. And, I'm, and I started, I started. First thing I set were the two diamonds. One diamond was a three and a half carat diamond, that's a big diamond. And the other was a little smaller. So I set, I put the thing, I didn't have a proper setting ball, so I put it in a vise, and then I bought myself in a jewelry supply store a setting tool, which is a, which is a tool, it goes into the palm of your hand, it has like a ball on the end of it, and then it's steel, and then it has an impression, uh, a little like uh, cavity on the front of it, 
tiny, tiny cavity that you grab the prong, you, you, you get, get a good hold of it, and you bend the, the uh, prongs down over the stone. The prongs have to be polished, finished, and ball shaped so they look beautiful. And I did all of that, and I pushed the prongs down on the diamonds, and I didn't have one problem. Both stones are set. My heart is going like this in my chest. I am about to go out of my mind. I'm almost done. I took the two smaller emeralds and I uh, bent the prongs. I didn't realize how hard platinum is. It's not like silver. When silver one is annealed, it's like lead. It's so soft and malleable and you can bend it and do anything with it. But platinum is very hard metal. And it takes some doing where your hand is shaking when you're pushing on the prong. So I set four prongs around two smaller emeralds, the two small emeralds. All I had to go do now was one more emerald. Well, I pushed down three prongs. Pushed them down very carefully over the top of the emeralds. And they just, there's a crown on top of a, a gem setting. And they just approached the crown. They're, they were two millimeters short of the crown, the very flat top part of each gemstone. And I set three. Now it's four o'clock in the morning, and all I had to do was set that one last stone, and I'm done. I'm bringing it to our house tomorrow, and I'm gonna collect my commission. I'm so bloody excited. I called my mother, three o'clock in the morning, woke her up. My mom gets on the phone, she says, what's wrong? I said, nothing's wrong. She said, 3 o'clock in the morning, you woke me up. I said, Mom, I'm almost done with this commission. I'm almost finished. All I've got to do is one more prong. My mom says, good luck, honey. I'm so proud of you. Moms always say, I'm so proud of you. My mother really loved me. And many times when I walk around the lake, I have my hand down. and Actually, I think I'm walking with my mother. She was my, my life. I, she was my angel. She put up with me. I'm telling you, I was difficult to, to grow up. Difficult, difficult kid. And my mother just sacrificed her life for me. And uh, I don't have to get into this, but my, mo my mom truly gave me unconditional love. And uh, so I, I said, okay, mom. And she said, good luck, honey. Finish it and good luck and bring it to her house. I'm so proud of you. You're amazing at everything you do. Everything you do, you're, you're a genius. Only my mother would say that to me. And uh, so I started pushing down the prong. I bent the prong over the stone. It's going down. And then I heard a noise. And I don't know if I can even, even emulate that noise. That noise was something like this. It, it was like this. It, made a, it was a little crackling noise. It went like this. And then my heart stopped. My heart stopped. My heart was like, and I said, oh no, oh, oh, oh no, God no, oh God no. And I'm talking to God. And I said, God no, God no. And I looked and there was an inclusion in the biggest emerald. It wasn't an inclusion. I said, oh, that's it. that was there, that line was there. And, uh, and then I took a tweezers, a, a very fine tweezers, and I touched the stone, the rocket, and I had cracked the bloody stone in half. I cracked a $5,000 emerald in half. And then I started, uh, holy shit, what am I gonna do now? Holy shit. And, 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 and the first thing I did was I called my mother and I woke her up and she said, What is it now? Are you done? I said, No, I cracked the $5,000 emerald. And my mother looked at me and she said, My mother said, I'm sorry. I said, Mom, what, what should I do? And she said, Call her and tell her you cracked it, you broke her emerald. Now just go and tell her you broke her emerald. I called her at 4.30 in the morning. And she, hello, who is this? And I said, it's Jerry. She's Jerry, it's 4.30 and what do you want? I said, Thelma, I have very bad news for you. I cracked the big emerald. 
I cracked it in half. It's broken. And then there was silence. And then she said to me, uh, Jerry, get yourself a very good lawyer. And my heart went, get yourself a very good lawyer. I called my mother back, Mom, I got to get a lawyer. She's going to sue me. And she did. She sued me. And she sued me for $12,000. I got sued. The big, great wax carver, the famous, the famous jeweler got sued for the first time in my life for 12. Now my whole salary from the Elizabeth school system at that time was a bit, for one year, was a bit more than $12,000. And when I lost in court, I had to pay her back out of my salary every paycheck until I paid back for that ring. And she took the ring, by the way. I drove it over her house. She says, give me the ring, and she took it from me. So that was my, that was my $1,100 worth of platinum. She had that too. And uh, she wanted me to sign some papers and I wouldn't sign them. And that nasty ass woman uh, sued me. And I called Mary and my friend Mary and Dick's up and I told her, I broke her emerald. The ring was beautiful, but I broke the emerald. And she's suing me. She said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry for you. That was another conversation. The first time in my life that I was sued by somebody in our great American country. In America, you spill your own hot coffee at McDonald's. You probably heard about this. Uh, they sue McDonald's for thousands of dollars because their coffee was too hot. And I was getting sued because I had made this ring, which was a disaster. And uh, I didn't have the ring anymore. And I had to pay out of my salary. Every time I got my salary, I had to send uh, eight or nine hundred U.S. dollars over her until I paid that twelve thousand dollar suit I was responsible. Okay, and I had didn't even know it that I signed a paper for those stones. She made me sign when I took the stones. So this is one thing that I sometimes I tell this story to my kids about thinking you're good at something, and really thinking you're good at something, until you really screw, I won't say another word, until you really screw up. And, uh, and, and this is what, this short circuits your life, and you don't, uh, you're not a brain surgeon anymore. It comes to you in your head that you're not a brain surgeon. Now somebody told me, a jeweler, my friend, that, that teacher of mine, Austin Goodwin, he told me, Jerry, you got to be very careful with emeralds. They're very soft stones. So a diamond has a, is a hardness of 10. It's hard as stone. And a ruby, it's 9 point something. An emerald is like a 4. It's a very soft stone. And when you bend the prong down on it, you may crack it. And that, my friends, is the story of the very first time I realized that I'm not such a hot shot. You know, and, and then I re always think of this thing that people tell you, well, if you can't do something, teach. <laughs> well, I'm teaching, you know, but it's the first time I've ever handled really valuable stones and got killed and I hate this lady. I hate her to tilt it. She's not alive anymore. She, she'd probably be a hundred years old.